Welcome to the State of Music. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by James Barker. James is the frontman lead guitarist of Ace City Racers. Welcome to the show, James. Hi, Paul. How are you doing? Lovely to speak to you again. It's always a pleasure. And where are you in the world? Uh, I'm in the south side of Glasgow over Battlefield Way. Um, so just stay just behind uh, the Battlefield Rest for anyone that knows where that is. Um, now... Let's talk then about Glasgow. Let's talk about musical heritage. Let's talk about venues, labels, bands. Um, I know that you studied in Glasgow. Talk to me about some of the influences that uh, yeah. Glasgow has given you. Well, uh, Glasgow is a really interesting one, isn't it? I think, um, I mean, I've, you know, obviously you can tell from my accent I'm not from Glasgow originally. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've lived here since the, you know, since, since the late 90s, really. Um, as, as a musical city, it's, you know, it's, it was somewhere where you could probably walk down the street and, you know, in non-COVID periods, there could be, you know, three, four, five gigs going on at the same time, you know, if you're on Suffolk Hill Street or whatever. Um, and I think it's something that is quite inherently part of the, the, the lifeblood and the culture, you know. Um, I, I think, you know, Glasgow bands have been punching above their weights for, you know, for 20, 30, 40 years or whatever. Now, I remember, uh, going to have to do some name dropping here, James, apologies in advance. I was down in Liverpool, I was down in Liverpool, uh, okay. and um, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you, but we were talking to uh, a, a fantastic musician called Edgar Summertime Jones, you're well aware yep. of oh, Edgar, well. um, you know, you were into the music of Edgar long before I was. And I was chatting away to him, and we were in this place called The Brink, which was a non-alcoholic kind of cafe place where um, it helped people get back at sober. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And as we were sitting in there having some fish and chips and uh, mushy peas with Edgar Jones at the stairs, in walked Mick Head. Uh, <laughs> oh, <wow>. So <laughs> th there was this wee moment when uh, Edgar basically said all right to him as, as if it was just some geezer. Yeah. And, I'm, and I'm sitting thinking, is it like this every day in Liverpool? Um, but I think similarly, you, you've told me tales about walking about Glasgow and uh, yeah. drinking with Justin Curry from Dale and <laughs> Mitre, you know, yes. it, it really does have that musical heritage though, Glasgow, and very similarly um, to Liverpool in many respects. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Socky Hall Street particularly, I think, you know, you used to have your nice and sleazies and stuff that all the musicians would go into, but also the Griffin as well, where, um, you know, you Teenage Fan Club could quite regularly be seen in the 90s. Um, I'm thinking myself, it was more... I knew people that played football and they, you know, they would, they would play every Tuesday and it tended to be people who had the time off to do it. So I think that seemed to encourage musicians. Um, so quite often on a Tuesday afternoon, I'd go down after work um, and meet, meet my pals who'd, who'd been playing football and didn't have to work for a, I'm not saying they'd have to work for a living, but you know what I mean. <laughs> and, and, and was like Justin Curry and goals and, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm, not I Norman know, Blake at left back. Well, I just know from the few occasions when he's been there that, the, 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 um, yeah, that it can be quite raucous. Um, but no, it was, it was generally like, yeah, um, people from the classical music scene and so on. Although I think it's had a float. I think that game of football's got, been going on for about 30 years now. Um, might be Tam Coyle that started. I'm not sure, but anyway. It's gone on for about thirty years, and a floating, you know, range of range of musicians that have come and gone. A pool, a pool of musicians. I've never, I've never been allowed in it because I'm too too skillless. But you know. Uh, so what do you do? But, Just sit in the the sidelines and uh, bar instructions <laughs> to people? No, I, I don't actually go. I've never actually been. I haven't been in years, but I haven't. Um, no, I um, I used to just go meet them in the pub afterwards. Brilliant. What kind of, you, you mentioned Nice and Sleazy's there, James. Again, I remember being in Glasgow many, many years ago and you took me in there just to show me the place. Um, what kind of venues then do you associate with, with some some of the music uh, of your own journey? Oh, God. Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting one. We, I don't think we've we've always taken the easiest um, route. I think, you know, we we, we, we played the usual ones, your Sleazy's, your King Tut's, um, these kind of places. But we, we've always kind of tried to take a slightly, whatever band I've been in, tried to take our own path. Um, and when we were in the previous band, Juno, you know, one of the things we did was we took over the Captain's Rest, as it was at the time, um, before it became a venue. Um, you know, and it basically was, you know, sort of your, your wood panelled, uh, mirrored, kind of a 1970s sort of, sort of, um, Dodgy, dodgy room and we you know we decorate it and have a residency there for a year or whatever um 
and then similarly with ice city races we similarly have taken other places and we've done art shows or places at the poetry club and so on you know where there's a bit more of an arty kind of a feel or you, you feel like you're putting on your own event we've always kind of sort that out rather than necessarily going on the, the gig treadmill Mm-hmm. Well, we have done we have done the standard ones as well you know is that um, the old uh stone roses vibe of doing events rather than just uh getting on that kind of the, the typical tried and tested venues yeah absolutely it was the stone roses that obviously I, you know i think when i was when i was very young that you know that, that kind of highlighted that to me but i think also a lot of you know you see in new york art scene and some of the, the other art, art school bands that have, have always done these sorts of things i think fran ferdinand did it the best in glasgow you know they would put them on at the chateau and uh, and so on um and gigs and you know jails and things like that you know just really strange places that you, you wouldn't expect but it gave it gave a, an element of you know excitement and an interest or danger or whatever whatever you want to call it rather than you go to your standard venue you pay your standard three quid and stand in line till exactly 8 30 when the band plays as as you would expect you know it just gave an element of unpredictability to things I don't know if you've spent much time in a jail cell, James, but um, no, not. <laughs> what is the what is the strangest venue that you've played? I remember a gig um, being played by Sonic Boom. Now, Sonic Boom was part of Spaceman 3, I think, yeah. and, and he played it in that hidden bunker, which um, is in yeah. St. Andrews, and it's so hidden that there's actually signs on the road yeah. to tell you where it is. Imagine that, yeah, yeah. Uh, I could imagine, also imagine how loud that would be, given, mm. you know, there's a, there's a lot of fuzz and everything. Oh, the strangest one. Um, probably, actually, when we played at Guruk Swimming Pool. That was weird. <laughs> <laughs> right, how did that work then? Were you in the pool with, <laughs> the, with the fans uh, no, basically but, uh, round about? Well, no, that was, that was the other thing that was hilarious about it. It was supposed to be an end of season um, sort of party thing that was going on. What they didn't tell us was that the end of season party was actually for primary kids. So they just had loads of primary kids coming out to listen to really loud three minute, you know, thrashy sort of post punk songs as we were doing at the time. And it was just utterly bizarre. Um, it was quite good fun. There's some good photos of Mark and me playing around with beach balls and stuff, you know. Um, but we also blew, blew the payout, payout that day, I think, because um, we, we didn't realize just how, how far the sound had to try to travel. And then you were shouting at primary school kids, amateurs, yeah, amateurs. No, yeah, no, <laughs> it was just totally surreal. Well, when I say you were in the pool, I was picturing it as an empty pool. Ah, no, no. We played by the side of the pool. Right. Yeah. Kind of okay. like, kind of like in, a, in a 1960s garage band type way, you know. Bizarre, uh, but but brilliant, actually, now that I'm picturing it. Um, and, and when we look I back... Gurek in March isn't the same as, you know, LA and, <laughs> and somewhere away. <laughs> I, want, I want to see these pictures, James, of uh, the Gurek swimming pool gig, yeah. the infamous gig. Um, but when you think back, and I've already mentioned Edgar Jones, you talk about seeing him playing for the, uh, you know, for the yeah, stairs so, way back yeah. in the day. What kind of gigs do you look back on that have endured the, the test of time for you, James? You see, yeah, so it's different different things for different reasons. I mean, uh, that was that was so that was Edgar supporting the Charlatans, and that was a big one just because it was the first ever gig I went to, and I was at like, fifteen at the time. And I remember going to, um, and I actually remember running down. My big cousin took me, and I, I went running down the stairwell at the back, thinking the place was on fire because there was this ringing noise, and I hadn't realised it was because my ears were ringing. So the very first gig I went, I went made a complete arse of myself by running by running away at the end of. <laughs> Ah, why is no one else panicking you know uh it was because my ears were ringing and you know i just hadn't been introduced to such live music before so that one's obviously in there uh i would always say um quite a few in spiral carpets because they were so great live stone roses when i finally got to see them uh, blur i think various ones that they've done i was lucky enough to see them on the sugary tea tour when they did girls and boys for the first time when they were you know, promoting modern life is rubbish and that was newcastle went to for that um that was quite quite incredible um they've done their place up to like the living room um and again also Ryan the charlatans at the barrowland uh, sorry the blackpool blackpool um, rock Black, was it yeah blackpool rocks yeah it was amazing um but there's, there's been there's been so many over the years to be honest with you so I many i'd need to go through my ticket stubs uh my collage of tickets and and have a look to see what ones i've been to um that, that you know those are ones that are from from a long time ago and there, there are still one you know, I, I do still get that thrill from music. Mm. Uh, comes less and less, I think, as you get older. 
you know. Does it? I, I find, yeah, I find the band have to be really, really good. I think mm. um, when I was younger, again, I was lucky enough to kind of grow up with the so-called sort of Brit pop era and, and so on, where there were lots of good bands coming to town every other every other week. You could see Super Fairy Animals, you know, for a fiver or whatever, you know. Um, and that was all very exciting, you know. It'd be some new band that you'd never heard of, and then they had a really great, good song in the charts the week later. Um, I think now, I think possibly, I, I go to less gigs, but when I do, you know, they tend to be really, the last really good one I went to see was actually David Byrne. That was that was amazing, um, but it was it was less of a gig and more of a one man show. It was mm. strange. It was like oh, every every musician um, was wearing you know wireless um, you know, sort of microphones and so on, and all the guitars were wireless and all. The whole thing was choreographed. Um, so you know, it kind of started off with a with him sort of sitting looking glum at a desk and singing to himself, and then it kind of before you know, there's twenty musicians all bent us out. Um, it, not the sort of thing I would ever have thought I really would have enjoyed, but it uh, it was it was just incredibly well put together and re really well done. Now, was he born in Dumbartonshire? He was, yes. Yeah, yeah, there you born go. Yeah, well, another, it's a good story, isn't it? Well, it's another part of the Scottish musical heritage. James, now you mentioned my cousin's recently related to him. Actually, is that right? Yeah, I'm sure. Or, or my cousin's husband. I'm sure. I need to double. I need. To, I need to fact check that. I don't want to, you know, go on Trump on you, but I need to fact check it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, you should. You should definitely do that. What incarnation of the Roses did you see then? Was it first album, second coming, or reformed? I've seen, yeah, I've seen them twice. Um, and the first time was the second coming. Um, and then the second time, obviously, was when they played Class of Green. I wasn't, I'm, I'm like some of our communal friends, lucky enough to see them in 1990 because I was 13, 14 at the time. Um, but yeah, the first time I saw them, the Barriers was great. We, we had to queue for five or six hours or something in the morning, I remember, outside um, was it Tower Records, it was HMV in South Hills. No, um, Renfield Street. Yeah, that was pretty weird, but it was good. Rennie, Rennie had left and it was Robbie J. Maddox on the drums by then, wasn't it? Yeah, it still worked though, it still worked. I think I think if you've been waiting that long to see them, you know, it was still, it was still exciting nonetheless. Um, but the thing is, I'd actually been to see <laughs> a few bands. The Roses were doing naughty things around that time, making um, claims that they were going to be um, turning up and playing under assumed names. Mm -hmm. and there was one, that, one day I remember getting really drunk and some people managed to persuade me that they were playing under the name Monster Magnet. At the garage, <laughs> I, I, I went rolling up. Going, oh, I can't believe there was a video on my own. Um, bought a ticket. It was some terrible rock band, basically, really bad. And I was like, "When are they going to, you know, play? I want to be adored." And they just didn't, obviously. Yeah, really, really bad. That that is pretty bad. It's pretty bad that you fell for it. To be fair, um, I felt but, a lot of things back then. <laughs> you, um, you're talking about the barras, and when you're you know, you think about iconic Scottish venues, the Barrowlands is certainly up there. You hear so many bands, James, name dropping the Barrowlands. Yeah. Um, you, you've also mentioned King Tut's Wawa Hut and um, you nonchalantly said that you've played there. You've, I think you've played there quite a few times, haven't you, yeah. the, uh, Tuts? Yeah, lots. <laughs> <laughs> lots, lots. How, how important are these these bands to um, Scottish music? They know the bands, the, the actual venues. How important are the venues to Scottish music? I think they are important because at, at different levels they represent different stages I think you know um, and the bar is obviously I think is probably the pinnacle that you know everyone would like to to um, to go to um, and I think you know something like King Tut's it's 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 one that I remember being very very excited to play the first ever time I played it and I've had I've had different experiences there but when it's good it's great you know, if, it, if it's a really full gig and sounds good and all the rest of it, because it's just, again, it's that thing, of, you know, so many people in a in a reasonably compact area, but with a really powerful sound system. So it just is quite, you know, quite full on. Um, the barriers, I mean, I, I love the barriers actually just as much as in for, for what it is as a building. Um, you know, it was the first ever place I went to see a gig, but I also love, you know, love going to like, the barrel of the soul things there and so on as well, because mm. it has that classic, you know, um, dance floor um and the you know the i suppose that, that kind of big echoey quality that actually really suits live music you know or, or even records uh, it's a different quality you know it's not very pristine or um whatever but it's got a really sort of soulful quality the room has 
You've, I mean, when you look at the history of it as well, and the fact that you know it was um, basically the 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 barrows, the people who mm. had barrows uh, who mm. went to the barrow lands um, to sell their wares at the market. Yeah. Um, you know, this was a way of them getting together. Uh, for a dance, you know, back in the yeah. day, like the ballroom dancing, and you know that's where it started. That's where it originated. There's a real rich history in the building, like you say. Yeah. Um, the last gig I went to before uh, the the lockdown was in actual fact at the Barrowlands. I went to see Primal Scream at oh, the Barrows, okay. okay. and um, you know Bobby Gillespie came on with his pink suit and all that kind of stuff on. <laughs> How, yeah. how how important how pivotal are Primal Scream uh, to your your own kind of musical history? I mean, for me, they're up there. They're always in and around my top three bands of all time. So it's funny. I think at the mo, I I go through kind of phases and waves with music. At the moment, um, I wouldn't say that they're particularly influential. However, I think when I was in the band Juno, you know, they would. I mean, you know the songs. They clearly were quite influential and. I think more than anything else, their ways of working, um, i.e., for me, the best thing about them is that they have a, a really, really open relationship with trying anything, you know. Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and I think that I share that same thing, which is that I, when I hear something, um, I immediately want to go and try and do something a bit like it. So, you know, you've got Primal Screen trying to do um, a techno record or Primal Screen trying to do a, you know, sort of a... Uh, southern you know rock record or you know whatever but clearly it's coming from a place of genuine enthusiasm for whatever they're doing and i think that's the bit that for me actually is is probably the you know the their biggest um the biggest influence you shouldn't be you shouldn't be afraid to kind of throw away what you've done before and, and start from scratch it doesn't mean that you didn't mean it it's just you know or that you know um that you were in some way just doing it for fashion sake or for this that or the next thing um, it just means that you've got an inquiring mind and you, you want to try new stuff, you know. And, and, and never re never repeat yourself. Never repeat yourself. Don't repeat yourself. If you do by accident, then that's fine. If you write a song that happens to sound a bit like one you've done before, then that's fine because you're only ripping yourself off. But, you know, uh, I think it would be a terrible moment in your song writer's life to say, you know, what we need to do is we need to recreate that moment when we did that, you know. Um I think it, I think it would suggest you've kind of run out of ideas or whatever. Do you you see it a lot with the the bigger bands and and I've thought quite a bit about this because I know you've mentioned quite a lot of bands there, James. But I also know that you were in the early days of Oasis. You were into that band. Uh, mm. You probably mm. bought the debut LP on the day of release, yep. kind of thing. You were there or thereabouts. Mm. But there there came a point I feel in the the lifespan of Oasis where mm. they went from being a band to a brand. And it was almost as if, yeah. you know, they couldn't possibly release an experimental fourth album because, it you know, there was so... Mm -hmm. Exactly. Do you think that was key in many ways to their demise? So I, right, I really loved them. And I saw them at the, when I was still at school, actually. I remember dog enough school to go and see them at, um, oh, what was it called? Ah, that place. Okay, the, the, rat, the Rat Trap, I think it was called. Yeah, The Rat Trap. Um, and you know, again, this was around about the time of Shaker Maker, and it was fantastic, and it was really exciting, you know. Um, and what they were doing was people, you know, people have often accused them of being a retro band, um, but what they were actually doing was quite new in terms of the way that they'd taken, you know, the sort of the fuzz of the Jesus and Mary Chain, but with the melody of the Beatles, and you know, a wee bit of the Sex Pistols and so on. But you know, there's a bit of musicality there as well, and it was thoroughly exciting. And the first album was fantastic. Second album had some fantastic moments. Still said some moments I was less keen on, if I'm being honest, but, you know, had some great moments. And then after that, I kind of thought, hmm, what are they going to do that's not, you know, isn't just repeating themselves? And I find it really interesting when there was there was one album when they tried it and they tried to sound a little bit like the Beta Band. I can't remember what album that was. I think the like song, the song was Go Let yeah, It Out. Out. Yeah. Yep. I remember actually thinking, this is quite good because they, they've given it a go. Although I also remember saying something at the time, saying, I bet all the Oasis fans think that they invented the beta band, you know. <laughs> they invented that sound. But, um, but at the same time, they, they kind of, that was about the, the extent of their experimental, you know. Mm. No, you're right. And then um, there was a couple of occasions, I think, where there was an opportunity for them to take a left turn. Uh, Death in Vegas. They were working with Death in oh, Vegas. Yeah. Chemical you know, well, yeah, yeah. 
Great stuff. And they could have they could have gone down that route, but they always came back to the Oasis brand, didn't they? I think yeah, and I think the problem was was they got to a stage uh, the way I, I I don't know I, I don't imagine Noel Gallagher's line worrying about what I think of the choices he made as a songwriter, but I think that, I think they got to a stage where they worked out what worked very well very quickly, mm-hmm. and they kind of didn't deviate from it. You know, even to the extent of you know I can't even think of an Oasis song that necessarily begins with a bass guitar. You know, and by that stage, if somebody as talented as Andy Bell on on bass, why not let him? You know, or single, why not let him? You know, do you know, set do a bit of jazz funk or whatever. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but you know, and then and then 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 introduce the other instruments, that kind of thing. You know, but generally everything would start with you know a guitar riff or whatever. When you said that, I just had visions of the mighty Bush there, um, <laughs> looking back to the mighty Bush <laughs> days. That's what um, my head like at the moment, Paul. Well, it is lockdown. It is lockdown. Um, no, that was it when they were looking for the new sound. That's right. That's right. But listen, mate, you're in your forties. You're doing fine with here. Don't worry about it. Uh, you've mentioned in dispatches being in a band called Juno. Now, mm. I know that you had been in a few bands prior to that that probably were very much Kadar based with a Hammond organ undercurrent. I would maybe suggest, and then you go and you form a band called Juno. And when I start hearing the the output, I'm thinking, where on earth did that come from? So you had done that. You had taken a big left turn, didn't you? And you went down a more kind of electronic pop route. What what inspired you to do that? I know Primal Scream were a big inspiration. Um, but, I mean, what made you do that? Was it just, let's try something different? Is that what was in your headspace at that time? Yeah, I think, if I'm being completely honest, the previous bands I've been in, um, myself and Jamie, who, who was the person that you know, did all the synths and backing within Juno and all the backing tracks, um, I think we had always somewhat, he played the Hammond, I played the guitar, and there'd been a bit too much musical competition in terms of fighting for space and overloading things with, you know, with sound. Um, and I, I took a conscious decision to focus on trying to write songs, you know, three, four, five chord songs, whatever, um, and leave the guitar um, theatrics, you know, out of the picture. And Jamie had been coming up with some great um, backing tracks at the time. So I can I think there was an essential bit of a let's let's let let Jamie and his keyboard and the backing fill the space, and I I kind of actually restricted the way I was playing as well um, to do that, um, and it very much was actually because it was much more democratic. The, the results were, were much better than some of the stuff that we'd we'd we've been doing certainly in the, in the band just previous to that, where we you know the songs were trying to be trying to come out of the the overloading of, of, of instruments that we that we were doing. So it was deliberately so let's let's strip things back and just put in, you know, what we need.
you must have thought, you know, once you started playing gigs and releasing some of your tunes, James, that you had struck uh, gold because it was very, very well received. Labels were getting interested. You were playing big um, gigs. You were playing festivals. Uh, talk to us about that that journey, which almost resulted in the release of your debut album, would you know? Um, yeah, it was, well, it was great fun. I think it was the main thing. And I think that most of the sort of the live reviews and and so on that were very kind about us uh, picked up on the fact it was fun and we were enjoying it. Um, you know, um, some of the gigs we had, we had quite a large retinue of people live doing different things. You know, playing percussion or brass or whatever, or whatever people fancy. Because we did have that kind of whilst we were, there was a core unit of us, a small number, we did also you know kind of open it up to other people and it's like the Brian Jonestown massacre you know if you, if you come along with a guitar you can you can get on stage kind of. <laughs> um, and, it, and I think people picked up and liked that that it, it was genuine um, and we did genuinely enjoy it. it you know it become actually funnily enough as we were getting more and more nice things said about it it actually become less fun and become harder because mm. we've got something to sort of do with it or live up to or you know convert into something and you started thinking in a more businessy sense which is which is never great but then what i found is that when uh, a pundit uh, or anyone within the, the kind of musical press fell for you know they fell um you know head first in love with the band they were they were in it for the long haul they loved you know and nice, yeah. <laughs> they, they were weren't they and what happened as well is obviously there were some tracks that um had a, a big kind of I don't even know what the the term would be. Was it electro pop kind of uh, mm-hmm. vibe? Yeah. And a yeah, big so. part of that was due to the production and also mm-hmm. some guest vocals from Mandarin of Bis fame yeah. as well. Was that another one of these Glasgow things where you just your paths crossed because you were moving in similar circles? So I was friends with Stephen anyway. Um, I've been friends with Stephen again through you know as we say through um, various people we knew for, for a couple of years. Um, and he runs Studio 7A, which is just actually really close to where, where we stay. It's not, sadly no longer a studio. Um, so we booked in basically to, to record a couple of couple of demos with him. Um, and we did two, one which sounded like the old band we'd been in, then one which was where we cut it loose, I remember it was, we took a chance. Um, and we came out going, oh, God, that sounds really different. You know, and we thought, actually, we'll throw away everything we've done before and I can the decision the decision was slightly made for us you know because it, it was obvious that there was such a discrepancy between the two and it was through Stephen that obviously um I might see best you know if you're going to see best anyway but like again since the sort of mid 90s um that we met Amanda and she very kindly agreed to sing on the song these boys are athletes which uh so to great effect to great effect James. Sort of saved us. <laughs> I think it saved us that one yeah now this is relevant because the album um, was recorded. Mm. It sounds tremendous. It was called Harder Than It Should Be. Am I right? Yeah. Um, about the process was harder than it should be. <laughs> Not the recording process, but the process of being in that band. Yeah. And, and being in the, in the business of the, the musical mm. world, I guess. And um, it was harder than it should have been. But it is an album that exists and people who tune into many of a state of minds channels, this one included, this show included, will recognise uh, Juno because um, a lot of the music is used. I mean, a Celtic state of mind, one of the, the channels on a state of mind, um, has had that particular intro and outro played, was it seven and a half million times at the last count, Jim? Is that right? <laughs> I don't <know>. it must be. <laughs> <laughs> We're heading towards ten million plays on that that one love, track. That's more love of Celtic than than, than love of Juno. <laughs> but you know, you guys are doing rather than us. Yeah, it's become it's become an absolute staple part of that show. I mean, it wouldn't be the same without that particular song you know, playing it in and playing it out. And what we're planning to do, uh, obviously with yourself, is to continue to to play some of these these tunes. So the intro you hear to the state of music is Juno, uh, Smoke and Mirrors, as it happens. Uh, and eventually, once people get familiar with more of the songs, we are going to work together in releasing the album because it's been, I think, 15 years since it should have been released. Is that right? Um, oh, let's think. So we, fin- right, so we finished it in 2000 and end of 2006 so it's supposed to come out 2007 
and then it got pushed back. It was supposed to be 2008, and then it didn't. And then I, I went in the half and <laughs> just said, right, <laughs> had enough of this because, um, yeah, it was supposed to come out, and, and it was just unfortunate. We'd had a couple of successful, so three three singles, I think, four singles, something like that. And it was all building, building, building. And then you with bands, you got to keep the momentum up, really. And the momentum was just lost by that stage. Um, and, yeah, kind of walked away. But it was a shame. It was a, it was a shame because the album was beautifully produced by Stephen. He pulled out all the stops and we put a heck of a lot of work into it and had a lot of guest musicians doing bits and pieces and stuff. And yeah, I listened to it not that long ago and went, hmm. Makes me a bit sad that. <laughs> but it will see the light of day. It will see the light yeah. of day. Remember it. Uh, remember the band appeared in the Fife Free Press. You yeah. were in. You were in the top hundred. Now was it the top hundred Scottish bands of all time? Something like that. <laughs> I don't know. Was it Fife bands? <laughs> Might well, you. <laughs> you were in, you were at number seventy. I do remember that. Um, I do remember seeing that in the Fife Free Press. How does Juno? evolve into a city racers um yes yeah. so with juno what had happened was we'd taken the electronic thing about as far as we could um and again it's funny you talk about the mighty bush because one of the songs that we did um the, the last single we did was sounded like a video machine or a get you know a console game or something and, and deliberately so i remember me and jamie making it making it like that um and we at that time we played with robots in disguise who were affiliated with mighty bush they were the they were the electro girls from it i don't know if you remember that i do i remember that yeah. it was all really good fun it was all you know everything was neon and glow sticky and all the rest of it um but i think after that i kind of i just started picking the guitar up again and i uh, gone back to kind of basics and sort of the things i used to listen to and and i wanted to start writing guitar music again um, where I kind of challenged myself a bit more on the guitar because I've been kind of playing bar chords and disco rhythms and not much else, you know, while, while I was in Juno. So it was good to kind of go back and do something a little more intricate again. No, and, and to be fair, that's more down my kind of street and talking mm. the streets. You worked with Stephen Street and uh, obviously Stephen Street w produced a lot of the records in your record collection, mm. James. How much of a thrill was it to go down to London and work with him? It was incredible, and I remember it's also really nerve-wracking. Um, so it was cool because we, we recorded in a place called The Strong Room in Shoreditch, which was really cool. It was, um, was it Julian Temple or somebody like that that had done the, the artwork for it? And, one you know, one of the punk artists, and the whole place was kind of done up in sort of punk, psychedelic um, kind of paint. It was a place called The Strong Room, uh, and it had its own beer garden in Shoreditch. And so it was a great place to record and it was lovely. But I mean, I remember when we went in, you know, I, I went in with my sort of Squire Telecaster, you know, cost me 90 quid and stuff. And uh, the drum kit we had, he actually said to us, you like one doing impression. I said, did you get, that looks like it's been in a war. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was a, an old 60s drum kit. We'd gotten, well, my dad, I think had gotten an auction or something, you know, I'm in front of one town hall auction. Um, and I just remember being at first quite, Quite, quite nervous but he, he was re he was really professional he put us at ease he was he was just basically a class act you know what i mean and after we finished it we sat and had a pint with him in a chat and it was all nice it was a shame we never got to do more stuff with him Just aren't my meal I'd love to 
Again, talking about lost albums, we had an album for him, and he sort of said, "Yes, I'd be up for doing this." But at the time, we just couldn't. We were just completely out of step. The guitar bands were just not popular at that at that point. Um, and I remember we played with Brother. Do you remember them, Viva Brother? I do. I do remember them. Yeah. And it seemed as if there was, you know, potential for a, a sort of a bit of a guitar resurgence um because they were also produced by Stephen Street at the time um it just never quite happened just never quite happened so um yeah. I remember seeing them I seen Viva Brothers supporting Morrissey yes that's right because he was a fan wasn't he mm. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. and again you've got the Stephen yeah. Street connection mm. um you mentioned the a Squire Telecaster was it yeah you still got it I do yes I have it here my Rack grab it, guitar. grab it, and your rack of guitars, yeah. So when you're when you're using a guitar like this, what kind of sound are you going for, James? So I guess with this, um, this is the sort of the you know sort of edgy kind of post post punk sort of sound, you know. And I think the, the two sort of people that for me, well, three people that tend to use Telecasters is Johnny Marr, um, Graham Cox, and obviously, you know. Yeah, so it's got a good choppy sort of sound, and Wilco Johnson as well, mm. you know. So, and this is actually similar ish in colour to the Wilco Johnson one, you know, kind of thing. Um, and it's really good fun to to kind of really abuse. And I used to call this my throwing Telecaster, because um, as I said, and I don't do that now, but it costs 90 quid, and you literally could throw it at things and bounce it off the ground. And there's some good videos of us doing it live, you know, doing that, and it wouldn't even go out of tune. You know, they're incredible. Robust. So, yeah, that was, that was the Keith Richards thing. You know, he reckoned that uh, there was some. They did some tests where they they run a Telecaster over with a truck or something. You know, and it, and it survived. They're really tough, really tough. It's one of the, it's one of the ones though. You wonder if it's a myth. I mean, you wouldn't have used Solvay and then glued yourself onto an aeroplane <laughs> like they did in the adverts. But they told you they told you you could do it. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. This one needs a bit of adjustment though because it's getting to the stage where I can just about. I lose my fingers under the under the strings. So. Didn't didn't you write a song called Wilco? We did, yes. And was, was that well a homage to Wilco Johnson? Yeah, it was it was written specifically as a B side, and I know that seems like setting your setting your sights very low. But we we deliberately wanted a two or a minute and a half song that we could stick on the B side of, um, of the different angle single, um, and we deliberately played it in the style of it. Although perhaps more like a punk band might play it rather than a sort of a very heavy R and B band. Brilliant! No, that's great. It's great to I, get. It's kind of, I can't remember what it is. Or something like that. You know, it's very sort of derivative. We didn't we didn't break any musical boundaries with that one. But you're playing your, you're it's playing yourself fun. down. You're playing yourself <laughs> down there. Now you've already mentioned the Poetry Club. It's a great venue. It's a venue that. Um, Belongs to Jim Lambie, fantastic yeah, Glas yeah. Glasgow based artist, world renowned Glasgow yeah. based artist, and um, your debut Ace City oh, Racers. I'm just doing out of view, but I don't know if you've seen this, Paul. Oh, nice! Yeah. It's about the I, haven't, yeah. I haven't actually seen that. Is that new? Uh, I got it. For, well, I don't know. I got it for Christmas, so uh, it's pretty cool. Oh, though. I'll it's need to pick cool. that up. Well, it's actually talking about the primal screen gig that they played in there and stuff as well. So. Brilliant. 
brilliant venue. And you used you used that venue to launch your uh, debut album with A City Racers. We talk did, to us yeah. talk to us about the record and the launch night. Uh, well, lunch night, we had a fabulous compare, obviously, Paul, uh, <laughs> for the evening. He was pretty good. He was pretty good. <laughs> um, no, again, it, it was great. We So that was that was, that album was um, similar to this Juno story. It was supposed to come out in the label, and for various reasons, the, the, it, it got pulled. So we did a self-release and organised the, the, um, the album launch ourselves. Uh, we had you know, some very good bands playing. We had Vincenzo playing as well. I think it was Tigerface played as well, and they're they're, they're a great band. Um, and it was just it's a, for anyone that's not been, it's a really cool venue. It's not particularly big, but it's again, it's it's very much in the art school tradition of it. It's, it's an interesting space. You know, it's got a train that the that smoke comes out of. You know, to act as the smoke machine and things like that. It's got washing machines lying around. <laughs> it's just it's just quite incongruous. It's not as you would uh, you know. Expect a normal venue, and that appealed to us, you know, from that kind of point of view. Um, ah, there's a there's a great mezzanine that you can stand on yeah. and watch yeah. overlook statue stage as well. It's a brilliant venue, superb venue. Yeah. And but just talking about it, it makes you miss going out and having these live events. It does, and again, the last time I was there was to see again Edgar Summertime, um, you know, and that, that was a great great night too, you know. Um, playing it when, when your things and it was just that kind of yeah yeah it, I, I do miss nights like that i must admit oh definitely like-minded people all under one roof you yeah know? yeah before we talk about your latest release james i'm going to ask you some um unexpected questions that you've not had time to prepare for but there's been a, a real scottish musical tinge running through this conversation mm -hmm. um so if you were to choose a scottish band to play the eurovision song contest what scottish band would it be well it'd be us actually because we wrote a song for it <laughs> this was not set up that question wasn't set up so you wrote a song you wrote a song for the eurovision song contest well, well, we wrote a song, not specifically for it, but we wrote a song, it's the last song on the new album, um, called You Need Love. It's a very unifying message, and the words in it are very much, uh, we felt, fitted the sort of the post-Brexit sort, of, um, uh, sort of sort of landscape, and you know, it is about bringing people together and all that kind of stuff. Mark actually did submit it for Eurovision. Did he? Uh, but we got, a, we got a very polite thanks, but no thanks. Um, Didn't the Beatles write "All You Need Is Love" for Eurovision? Was that not intended for Eurovision? Know. I don't know. It's, it's of a similar kind of a feel to to what we're doing. Uh, yeah, I'm not likening us to the Beatles, but yeah, but the, the same sort of vibe. same vibe, same vibe. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, not good answer. And just to confirm, I didn't know that you had written a song for right, the Eurovision okay. Song Contest. Right? Well, if it wasn't, um, <laughs> I would probably say uh, Franz Ferdinand would be your best bet. <laughs> Good shout. Yeah. Good shout indeed. They, they what about... Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. And very visual. Very visual, which I think is important for such a, uh, a lofty stage. Yeah. S the Scottish front man you would have as Prime Minister, James. Oh, my God. Scottish front man I would have as Prime Minister. So you want somebody that could go out there and not be embarrassing... A sensible head in their shoulders. Ooh. It's going to have to be somebody from Teenage Fan Club. It's probably going to have to be like Norman Blake or somebody, isn't it? Somebody, you know, it's quite, you know, yeah. reserved, sensible chap, you know? I could see him doing that. I absolutely yeah. could see Norman Blake being the Prime Minister. Yeah. Um, absolutely, no doubt about it. <laughs> and finally, <laughs> finally, who would be the next James Bond if it was a Scotsman? Oh, the next James Bond, if it was a Scotsman. See, unfortunately, I've got a mental block at the moment because I can only think of the Danny Dyer thing where he put himself forward as James Bond. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Somebody sent me it last week and I was killing myself laughing. It was um, you know, so it's a picture of Bond sitting there with his martini. It's like, it's like, half a lager and a snap, please, love. You know, sort of something horrible like that. Danny Dyer is coming out. Um, so I've got that stuck in my head. Scottish James Bond, who would be a really good one? I seen a story last week. The reason I ask, I seen a story right. last week that Martin Compson was, was in the running. I was going to say, Compson's about the best actor, isn't he? Would you go for Compson? I don't know. Is his accent going to be better than the Line of Duty one? I hope so. 
<laughs> I really like Martin Compton, actually. I think he's great. Uh, I, yeah, despite the occasional accent wobble in that. Um, yeah, I think he probably would have to be. It would have to be, wouldn't it? Because he's probably... I don't know. Is it, I don't know how tall he is. Do you have to be tall to be James Bond? I don't know if, if they're into that kind of thing, mate, to be fair. But we'll go with Martin Compton. You can change yeah, your mind the next time you come yeah, on the show. Um, you are what I would describe as prolific. There's a lot of lost albums out there, James, um, that you've written or you've been part of. Talk to us about your new single and introduce it to us because we're going to play the video. Okay. Um, so the new single is called Gideon Takes the Train and it is um, it basically, it, it was written, I suppose, in reaction. It was written a few years ago. It was the first, one of the first songs to be written for the for this Tower Disco album, which we're releasing in June. Um, and it was it was actually quite a political thing. Um, it was it was right George Osborne at the time, and that's Gideon being his middle name. Um, and it was very much I, the, the, we kind of felt that a lot of the decisions that were being made in the country were kind of being made to people, um, and without necessarily without people having any form of you know kind of, sort of say or consent in what was happening to them in terms of austerity and so on. Um, and we also kind of had this nagging idea and I remember it was one day I was trying to program a drum machine on a train of the mechanism of um, parliament and so on as being kind of something that's just like this thing chugging along you know in a metronomic sort of a way that people can't stop or slow down or, or in any way shape or form kind of hijack um, so that was why we, we kind of wrote that and it was the idea that people were, were you know essentially making decisions and the, the, the country was moving in a clockwork way I suppose you can really influence. Now, it's an interesting video uh, because obviously it has had a, a kind of video release and um, a lot of nice words have been said about the single. Talk to us about the video as well because mm. I, I think visually you always uh, you know, take a lot of time to ensure that the, the whole visual package is right. Uh, I know you did that with Juno, you're doing it with Ace City Racers, but it's quite an absurd wee video. And, and in fact, I, I probably got a wee bit of a Mighty Bush vibe from it as well. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we, we, first of all, we can't take much credit for the video because that was um, a very talented filmmaker and musician called Ian McCall that pulled the video together. He came up with the concept and basically said, you know, the concept of somebody being a, a sort of evil businessman or whatever who gets his comeuppance from a giant paperclip, you know, um, it's, 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 <laughs> it's barely out there. Um, but it is. Uh, but he, you know, he, he put us through the ringer as you can see doing it, um, and you know, no, no sort of expense was spared in, in humiliating me and making me look, look fairly awful uh, in the role. Um, but. It was, it was worth doing. It was it was quite quite an art piece. We did feel that we kind of put ourselves through it to do it, if that makes sense. Um, but he built the set all in his uh, in his in his room, you know, in his house. Uh, Brilliant, amazing. So we had a small budget. I mean, he went away and bought all the bits and built those things. Um, he's actually done the videos for the next two singles as well. So again, as you were saying, in terms of trying to keep everything as a package, we have the same fella doing uh, who's done the videos for the for the next two singles for the album. Looking cool. forward to that. When's the album, did you say? When's that coming out? Uh, it's going to be the 4th of June. 4th of June. Now, talking of middle names, you said that Gideon, obviously, uh, a, a middle name. Emil Heskey. Any idea what Emil Heskey's middle name is, James? <gasps> Ivanhoe. What? Yep. Write a I song about that, son. <laughs> wow. Ivanhoe. That's his middle name. How good's that? You'd feel great about yourself in the morning, wouldn't you, getting up with that? You'd maybe swap wow. your middle name for your first name, wouldn't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> James, here is Gideon Takes the Train by Ace City Racers.
laughing at poverty, loving the novelty. Just a man in a suit on a train with a drum machine